It is now 35 years since, on the 2nd of August, I stood on the rostrum in the hall of this institute before another such audience as this and read a paper on the operation of venal tumors. I was then a pupil of this institution and was just at the end of my studies. I had never seen a tumor cut, and the subject matter of my lecture was merely compiled from books. But book knowledge played at that time a far wider and far more influential part in medicine than we are at present disposed to assign to it. It was at a period of fermentation, of the fight between learned tradition and the new spirit of natural science, which would have no more of tradition, but wished to depend upon individual experience. The authorities at that time judged more favorably of my essay than I did myself, and I still possess the books which were awarded to me as the prize. The recollections which crowd in upon me on this occasion have brought vividly before my mind a picture of the then condition of our science, of our endeavors, and of our hopes, and have led me to compare the past state of things with that into which it has developed. Much indeed has been accomplished. Although all that we hoped for has not been fulfilled, and many things have turned out differently from what we wished, yet we have gained much for which we could not have dared to hope. Just as a history of the world has made one of its few giant steps before our eyes, so also has our science. Hence, an old student, like myself, scarcely recognizes the somewhat matronly aspect of Dame Medicine when he accidentally comes again in relation to her. So vigorous and so capable of growth has she become in the fountain of youth of the natural sciences. I may, perhaps, retain the impression of this antagonism more freshly than those of my contemporaries whom I have the honor to see assembled before me, and who, having remained permanently connected with science and practice, have been less struck and less surprised by great changes taking place as they do by slow steps. This must be my excuse for speaking to you about the metamorphosis which has taken place in medicine during this period, and with the results of whose development you are better acquainted than I am. I should like the impression of this development and its causes not to be quite lost on the younger of my hearers. They have no special incentive for consulting the literature of that period. They would meet with principles which would appear as if written in a lost tongue so that it is by no means easy for us to transfer ourselves into the mode of thought of a period which is so far behind us. The course of development of medicine is an instructive lesson on the true principles of scientific inquiry, and the positive part of this lesson has, perhaps, in no previous time been so impressively taught as in the last generation. The task falls to me of teaching that branch of the natural sciences which has to make the widest generalizations, and has to discuss the meaning of fundamental ideas, and which has, on that account, been not unfitly termed natural philosophy by the English-speaking peoples. Hence, it does not fall too far out of the range of my official duties and of my own studies if I attempt to discourse here of the principles of scientific method in reference to the sciences of experience. As regards my acquaintance with the tone of thought of the older medicine, independently of the general obligation, incumbent on every educated physician of understanding the literature of his science and the direction as well as the conditions of its progress, there was in my case a special incentive. In my first professorship at Königsberg, from the year 1849 to 1856, I had to lecture each winter on general pathology, that is, on that part of the subject which contains the general theoretical conceptions of the nature of disease and of the principles of its treatment. General pathology was regarded by our elders as the fairest blossom of medical science, but, in fact, that which formed its essence possesses only historical interest for the disciples of modern natural science. Many of my predecessors have broken a lance for the scientific defense of this essence, and more especially, Henle and Lotz. The latter, whose starting point was also medicine, had, in his general pathology and therapeutics, arranged it very thoroughly and methodically and with great critical acumen. My own original inclination was toward physics. External circumstances compelled me to commence the study of medicine, which was made possible to me by the liberal arrangements of this institution. 
It had, however, been the custom of a former time to combine the study of medicine with that of natural sciences, and whatever in this was compulsory, I must consider fortunate, not merely that I entered medicine at a time in which any one who was even moderately at home in physical considerations found a fruitful virgin soil for cultivation, but I also considered the study of medicine to have been that training which preached more impressively and more convincingly than any other could have done the everlasting principles of all scientific work, principles which are so simple and yet are ever forgotten again, so clear and yet always hidden by a deceptive veil. Perhaps only he can appreciate the immense importance and the fearful practical scope of the problems of medical theory who has watched the fading eye of approaching death and witnessed the distracted grief of affection, and who has asked himself the solemn questions, has all been done which could be done to ward off the dread event? Have all the resources and all the means which science has accumulated become exhausted? Provided that he remains undisturbed in his study, the purely theoretical inquirer may smile with calm contempt when, for a time, vanity and conceit seek to swell themselves in science and stir up a commotion. Or he may consider ancient prejudices to be interesting and uh, pardonable, as remains of poetic romance or of youthful enthusiasm. To one who has to contend with the hostile forces of fact, indifference and romance disappear. That which he knows and can do is exposed to severe tests, he can only use the hard and clear light of facts and must give up the notion of lulling himself into agreeable illusions. I rejoice, therefore, that I can once more address an assembly consisting almost exclusively of medical men who have gone through the same school. Medicine was once the intellectual home in which I grew up, and even the emigrant best understands and is best understood by his native land. If I am called upon to designate in one word the fundamental error of that former time, I should be inclined to say that it pursued a false ideal of science in a one-sided and erroneous reverence for the deductive method. Medicine, it is true, was not the only science which was involved in this error, but in no other science have the consequences been so glaring or have so hindered progress as in medicine. The history of this science claims, therefore, a special interest in the history of the development of the human mind. None other is, perhaps, more fitted to show that a true criticism of the sources of cognition is also, practically, an exceedingly important object of true philosophy. The proud word of Hippocrates, intros philosophos is utheos, godlike is the physician who is a philosopher, served, as it were, a banner of the old deductive medicine. We may admit this, if only we once agree, what we understand as a philosopher. For the ancients, philosophy embraced all theoretical knowledge. Their philosophers pursued mathematics, physics, astronomy, natural history, in close connection with true philosophical or metaphysical considerations. If, therefore, we are to understand the medical philosopher of Hippocrates to be a man who has a perfected insight into the causal connection of natural processes, we shall, in fact, be able to say with Hippocrates, such a one can give help like a god. Understood in this sense, the aphorism describes in three words the ideal which our science has to strive after. But who can allege that it will ever attain this ideal? But those disciples of medicine who thought themselves divine, even in their own lifetime, and who wished to impose themselves upon others as such, were not inclined to postpone their hopes for so long a period. The requirements for the philosophos were considerably moderated. Every adherent of any cosmological system, in which, for well or ill, facts must be made to correspond with reality, felt himself to be a philosopher. The philosophers of that time knew little more of the laws of nature than the unlearned layman, but the stress of their endeavors was laid upon thinking, upon the logical consequence and completeness of the system. It is not difficult to understand how in periods of youthful development such a one-sided overestimate of thought could be arrived at. 
the superiority of man over animals, of the scholar over the barbarian, depends upon thinking. Sensation, feeling, perception, on the contrary, he shares with his lower fellow creatures, and in acuteness of the senses, many of these are even superior to him. That man strives to develop his thinking faculty to the utmost is a problem on the solution of which the feeling of his own dignity, as well of his own practical power, depends. And it is a natural error to have considered unimportant the dowry of mental capacities which nature had given to animals, and to have believed that thought could be liberated from its natural basis, observation and perception, to begin its Icarian flight of metaphysical speculation. It is, in fact, no easy problem to ascertain completely the origins of our knowledge. An enormous amount is transmitted by speech and writing. This power which man possesses of gathering together the stores of knowledge of generations is the chief reason of his superiority over the animal, who is restricted to an inherited blind instinct and to its individual experience. But all transmitted knowledge is handed on already formed, whence the reporter has derived it, or how much criticism he has bestowed on it, can seldom be made out, especially if the tradition has been handed down through several generations. We must admit it all upon good faith. We cannot arrive at the source, and when many generations have contented themselves with such knowledge, have brought no criticism to bear upon it, have indeed gradually added all kinds of small alterations, which ultimately grew up to large ones, after all this, Strange things are often reported and believed under the authority of primeval wisdom. A curious case of this kind is the history of the circulation of the blood, of which we shall still have to speak. But another kind of tradition by speech, which long remained undetected, is even still more confusing for one who reflects upon the origin of knowledge. Speech cannot readily develop names for classes of objects or for classes of processes if we have not been accustomed very often to mention together the corresponding individuals, things, and separate cases, and to assert what there is in common about them. They must, therefore, possess many points in common. Or if we, reflecting scientifically upon this, select some of these characteristics and collate them to form a definition, the common possession of these selected characteristics must necessitate that in the given cases a great number of other characteristics are to be regularly met with, there must be a natural connection between the first and the last named characteristics. If, for instance, we assign the name of mammals to those animals which, when young, are suckled by their mothers, we can assert further, in reference to them, that they are all warm-blooded animals, born alive, that they have a spinal column but no quadrate bone, breathe through lungs, have separate divisions of the heart, and so forth. Hence the fact that in the speech of an intelligent observing people, a certain class of things are included in one name, indicates that these things, or cases, fall under a common natural relationship. By this alone, a host of experiences are transmitted from preceding generations without this appearing to be the case. The adult, moreover, when he begins to reflect upon the origin of his knowledge, is in possession of a huge mass of everyday experiences, which, in great part, reach back to the obscurity of his first childhood. Everything individual has long been forgotten, but the similar traces which the daily repetition of similar cases has left in his memory have deeply engraved themselves, and since only that which is in conformity with law is always repeated with regularity, these deeply impressed remains of all previous conceptions are just the conceptions of what is conformable to law in the things and processes. Thus man, when he begins to reflect, finds that he possesses a wide range of acquirements of which he knows not whence they came, which he has possessed as long as he can remember. We need not refer even to the possibility of inheritance by procreation. These conceptions which he has formed, which his mother tongue has transmitted, assert themselves as regulative powers, even in the objective world of fact, and as he does not know that he or his forefathers have developed these conceptions from the things themselves, the world of facts seems to him, like his conceptions, to be governed by intellectual forces. We recognize this psychological anthropomorphism from the ideas of Plato to the imminent dialectic of the cosmical process of Hegel and to the unconscious will of Schopenhauer. Natural science, which in former times was virtually identical with medicine, 
followed the path of philosophy. The deductive method seemed to be capable of doing everything. Socrates, it is true, had developed the inductive conception in the most instructive manner, but the best which he accomplished remained virtually misunderstood. I will not lead you through the motley confusion of pathological theories which, according to the varying inclination of their authors, sprouted up in consequence of this or the other increase of natural knowledge, and were mostly put forth by physicians, who obtained fame and renown as great observers and empirics, independently of their theories. Then came the less gifted pupils, who copied their master, they exaggerated his theory, made it more one-sided and more logical, without regard to any discordance with nature. The more rigid the system, the fewer and the more thorough were the methods to which the healing art was restricted. The more the schools were driven into a corner by the increase in actual knowledge, the more did they depend upon the ancient authorities, and the more intolerant were they against innovation. The great reformer of anatomy, Vesalius, was cited before the theological faculty of Salamanca. Servetus was burned at Geneva, along with his book, in which he described the circulation of the lungs, and the Paris faculty prohibited the teaching of Harvey's doctrine of the circulation of the blood in its lecture rooms. At the same time, the basis of the systems from which these schools started were mostly views on natural science, which it would have been quite right to utilize within a narrow circle. What was not right was the delusion that it was more scientific to refer all diseases to one kind of explanation than to several. What was called the solidar pathology wanted to deduce everything from the altered mechanism of the solid parts, especially from their altered tension, from the strictum and laxum, from tone and want of tone, and afterwards from strained or relaxed nerves and from obstructions in the vessels. Humoral pathology was only acquainted with alterations in mixture, the four cardinal fluids, representatives of the classical four elements, blood, phlegm, black and yellow gall, with others, the acrimonies, or discrazies, which had to be expelled by sweating and purging, in the beginning of our modern epoch, the acids and alkalis, or the alchemistic spirits, and the occult qualities of the substances assimilated, all these were the elements of this chemistry. Along with these were found all kinds of physiological conceptions, some of which contained remarkable foreshadowings, such as the hemphuton thermon, the inherent vital force of Hippocrates, which is kept up by nutritive substances. This again boils in the stomach and is the source of all motion. Here the thread has begun to be spun, which subsequently led a physician to the law of the conservation of force. On the other hand, the pneuma, which is half spirit and half air, which can be driven from the lungs into the arteries and fills them, has produced much confusion. The fact that air is generally found in the arteries of dead bodies, which indeed only penetrates in the moment in which the vessels are cut, led the ancients to the belief that air is also present in the arteries during life. The veins only remained then in which blood could circulate. It was believed to be formed in the liver to move from there to the heart and through the veins to the organs. Any careful observation of the operation of bloodletting must have taught that, in the veins, it comes from the periphery and flows towards the heart. But this false theory had become so mixed up with the explanation of fever and of inflammation that it acquired the authority of a dogma which it was dangerous to attack. Yet the essential and fundamental error of this system was, and still continued to be, the false kind of logical conclusion to which it was supposed to lead, the conception that it must be possible to build a complete system which would embrace all forms of disease and their cure upon any one such simple explanation. Complete knowledge of the causal connection of one class of phenomena gives, finally, a logical, coherent system. There is no prouder edifice in the most exact thought than modern astronomy, deduced even to the minutest of its small disturbances, from Newton's law of gravitation. But Newton had been preceded by Kepler, who had, by induction, collated all the facts, and the astronomers have never believed that Newton's force excluded the simultaneous action of other forces. They have been continually on the watch to see whether friction, resisting media, and swarms of meteors have not also some influence. The older philosophers and physicians believed that they could deduce, 
before they had settled their general principles by induction. They forgot that a deduction can have no more certainty than the principle from which it is deduced, and that each new induction must in the first place be a new test, by experience, of its own bases, that a conclusion is deduced by the strictest logical method from an uncertain premise, does not give it a hair's breadth of certainty or of value. One characteristic of the schools which built up their system on such hypotheses, which they assumed as dogmas, is the intolerance of expression which I have already partially mentioned. One who works upon a well-ascertained foundation may readily admit an error. He loses, by so doing, nothing more than that in which he erred. If, however, the starting point has been placed upon a hypothesis which either appears guaranteed by authority, or is only chosen because it agrees with that which it is wished to believe true, any crack may then hopelessly destroy the whole fabric of conviction. The convinced disciples must therefore claim, for each individual part of such a fabric, the same degree of infallibility. For the anatomy of Hippocrates, just as much as for fever crises, every opponent must only appear, then, as stupid or depraved, and the dispute will, thus, according to old precedent, be so much more the passionate and personal, the more uncertain is the basis which is defended. End of section 13We have frequent opportunities of confirming these general rules in the schools of dogmatic deductive medicine. They turn their intolerance partly against each other, and partly against the eclectics who found various explanations for various forms of disease. This method, which in its essence is completely justified, had, in the eyes of the systematists, the defect of being illogical, and yet the greatest physicians and observers Hippocrates at the head, Arataeus, Galen, Sydenham, and Berhav have become eclectics, or at any rate, very lax, systematists. About the time when we seniors commenced the study of medicine, it was still under the influence of the important discoveries which Albrecht von Haller had made on the excitability of nerves, and which he had placed in connection with the vitalistic theory of the nature of life. Haller had observed the excitability in the nerves and muscles of amputated members. The most surprising thing to him was that the most varied external actions, mechanical, chemical, thermal, to which electrical ones were subsequently added, had always the same result, namely, that they produced muscular contraction. They were only quantitatively distinguished as regards their action on the organism, that is, only by the strength of the excitation. He designated them by the common name of stimulus. He called the altered condition of the nerve the excitation, and its capacity of responding to a stimulus the excitability which was lost at death. This entire condition of things, which, physically speaking, asserts no more than that the nerves, as concerned the changes which take place in them after excitation, are in an exceedingly unstable state of equilibrium, this was looked upon as the fundamental property of animal life, and was unhesitatingly transferred to the other organs and tissues of the body, for which there was no similar justification. It was believed that none of them were active of themselves, but must receive an impulse by a stimulus from without. Air and nourishment were considered to be the normal stimuli. The kind of activity seemed, on the contrary, to be conditioned by the specific energy of the organ under the influence of the vital force. Increase or diminution of the excitability was the category under which the whole of the acute diseases were referred, and from which indications were taken as to whether the treatment should be lowering or stimulating. The rigid one-sidedness and the unrelenting logic with which Robert Brown had once worked out this system was broken, but it always furnished the leading points of view. The vital force had formerly lodged as ethereal spirit, as a pneuma in the arteries. It had then, with Paracelsus, acquired the form of an archaeus, a kind of useful cobalt or indwelling alchemist, and had acquired its clearest scientific position as soul of life, anima insia, in Georg Ernst Stahl, who, in the first half of the last century, was professor of chemistry and pathology in Halle. 
stahl had a clear and acute mind which is informing and stimulating from the way in which he states the proper question even in those cases in which he decides against our present views he it is who established the first comprehensive system of chemistry that of phlogiston if we translate his phlogiston into latent heat the theoretical basis of his system passed essentially into the system of lavoisier stahl did not then know oxygen which occasioned some false hypotheses for instance on the negative gravity of phlogiston stahl's soul of life is on the whole constructed on the pattern on which the pietistic communities of that period represented to themselves the sinful human soul it is subject to errors and passions to sloth fear impatience sorrow indiscretion despair the physician must first appease it or then incite it or punish it and compel it to repent and the way in which at the same time he established the necessity of the physical and vital actions was well thought out the soul of life governs the body and only acts by means of the physico-chemical forces of the substances assimilated but it has the power to bind and to loose these forces to allow them full play or to restrain them after death the restrained forces become free and evoke putrefaction and decomposition for the refutation of this hypothesis of binding and loosing it was necessary to discover the law of the conservation of force the second half of the previous century was too much possessed by the principles of rationalism to recognize openly stahl's soul of life it was presented more scientifically as vital force vis vitalis while in the main it retained its functions and under the name of nature's healing power it played a prominent part in the treatment of diseases the doctrine of vital force entered into the pathological system of changes in irritability the attempt was made to separate the direct actions of the virus which produced the disease in so far as they depended on the play of blind natural forces the symptomata morbi from those which brought on the reaction of vital force the symptomata reactionis the latter were principally seen in inflammation and in fever it was the function of the physician to observe the strength of this reaction and to stimulate or moderate it according to circumstances the treatment of fever seemed at that time to be the chief point to be that part of medicine which had a real scientific foundation in which the local treatment fell comparatively into the background the therapeutics of febrile diseases had thereby become very monotonous although the means indicated by theory were still abundantly used and especially bloodletting which since that time has almost been entirely abandoned therapeutics became still more impoverished as the younger and more critical generation grew up and tested the assumptions of that which was considered to be scientific among the younger generation were many who in despair as to their science had almost entirely given up therapeutics or on principle had grasped at an empiricism such as rademacher then taught which regarded any expectation of a scientific explanation as a vain hope what we learned at that time were only the ruins of the older dogmatism but their doubtful features soon manifested themselves the vitalistic physician considered that the essential part of the vital processes did not depend upon natural forces which doing their work with blind necessity and according to a fixed law determined the result what these forces could do appeared quite subordinate and scarcely worth a minute of study he thought that he had to deal with a soul-like being to which a thinker a philosopher and an intelligent man must be opposed may i elucidate this by a few outlines at this time auscultation and percussion of the organs of the chest were being regularly practised in the clinical wards but i have often heard it maintained that they were a coarse mechanical means of investigation which a physician with a clear mental vision did not need and it indeed lowered and debased the patient who was anyhow a human being by treating him as a machine to feel the pulse seemed the most direct method of learning the mode of action of the vital force and it was practised therefore as by far the most important means of investigation to count with a repeater was quite unusual but seemed to the old gentleman as a method not quite in good taste there was as yet no idea of measuring temperature in cases of disease in reference to the ophthalmoscope 
a celebrated surgical colleague said to me that he would never use the instrument it was too dangerous to admit crude light into diseased eyes another said the mirror might be useful for physicians with bad eyes his however were good and he did not need it a professor of physiology of that time celebrated for his literary activity and noted as an orator and intelligent man had a dispute on the images in the eye with his colleague the physicist the latter challenged the physiologist to visit him and witness the experiment the physiologist however refused his request with indignation alleging that a physiologist had nothing to do with experiments they were of no good but for the physicist another aged and learned professor of therapeutics who occupied himself much with the reorganization of the universities was urgent with me to divide physiology in order to restore the good old time that i myself should lecture on the really intellectual part and should hand over the lower experimental part to a colleague whom he regarded as good enough for the purpose he quite gave me up when i said that i myself considered experiments to be the true basis of science i mention these points which i myself have experienced to elucidate the feeling of the older schools and indeed of the most illustrious representatives of medical science in reference to the progressive set of ideas of the natural sciences in literature these ideas naturally found feebler expression for the old gentlemen were cautious and worldly wise you will understand how great a hindrance to progress such a feeling on the part of influential and respected men must have been the medical education of that time was based mainly on the study of books there were still lectures which were restricted to mere dictation for experiments and demonstrations in the laboratory the provision made was sometimes good and sometimes the reverse there were no physiological and physical laboratories in which the student himself might go to work liebig's great deed the foundation of the chemical laboratory was complete as far as chemistry was concerned but his example had not been imitated elsewhere yet medicine possessed in anatomical dissections a great means of education for independent observation which is wanting in the other faculties and to which i am disposed to attach great weight microscopic demonstrations were isolated and infrequent in the lectures microscopic instruments were costly and scarce i came into possession of one by having spent my autumn vacation in eighteen forty one in the charite prostrated by typhoid fever as pupil i was nursed without expense and on my recovery i found myself in possession of the savings of my small resources the instrument was not beautiful yet i was able to recognize by its means the prolongations of the ganglionic cells in the invertebrata which i described in my dissertation and to investigate the vibrions in my research on putrefaction and fermentation any of my fellow students who wished to make experiments had to do so at the cost of his pocket money one thing we learned thereby which the younger generation does not perhaps learn so well in the laboratories that is to consider in all directions the ways and means of attaining the end and to exhaust all possibilities in the consideration until a practicable path was found we had it is true an almost uncultivated field before us in which almost every stroke of the spade might produce remunerative results it was one man more especially who aroused our enthusiasm for work in the right direction that is johannes muller the physiologist in his theoretical views he favored the vitalistic hypothesis but in the most essential points he was a natural philosopher firm and immovable for him all theories were but hypotheses which had to be tested by facts and about which facts alone could decide even the views upon those points which most easily crystallize into dogmas on the mode of activity of the vital force and the activity of the conscious soul he tried continually to define more precisely to prove or to refute by means of facts and although the art of anatomical investigation was most familiar to him and he therefore recurred most willingly to this yet he worked himself into the chemical and physical methods which were more foreign to him he furnished the proof that fibrine is dissolved in blood he experimented on the propagation of sound in such mechanisms as are found in the drum of the ear 
he treated the action of the eye as an optician his most important performance for the physiology of the nervous system as well as for the theory of cognition was the actual definite establishment of the doctrine of the specific energies of the nerves in reference to the separation of the nerves of motor and sensible energy he showed how to make the experimental proof of bell's law of the roots of the spinal cord so as to be free from errors and in regard to the sensible energies he not only established the general law but carried out a great number of separate investigations to eliminate objections and to refute false indications and evasions that which hitherto had been imagined from the data of everyday experience and which had been sought to be expressed in a vague manner in which the true was mixed up with the false or which had just been established for individual branches such as by dr young for the theory of colors or by sir charles bell for the motor nerves that emerged from Mueller's hands in a state of classical perfection a scientific achievement whose value i am inclined to consider as equal to that of the discovery of the law of gravitation his scientific tendency and more especially his example were continued in his pupils we had been preceded by schwann henle reichardt peters remach i met as fellow students e dubois raymond verschau bruck ludwig troba j meyer lieberkun hallmann we were succeeded by a von graffe w busch max schulze a schneider microscopic and pathological anatomy the study of organic types physiology experimental pathology and therapeutics ophthalmology developed themselves in germany under the influence of this powerful impulse far beyond the standard of rival adjacent countries this was helped by the labors of those of similar tendencies among Mueller's contemporaries among whom the three brothers weber of leipzig must first of all be mentioned who have built solid foundations in the mechanism of the circulation of the muscles of the joints and of the ear the attack was made wherever a way could be perceived of understanding one of the vital processes it was assumed that they could be understood and success was justified in this assumption a delicate and copious technical apparatus has been developed in the fields of microscopy of physiological chemistry and of vivisection the latter greatly facilitated more particularly by the use of anaesthetic ether and of the paralyzing curara by which a number of deep problems became open to attack which to our generation seemed hopeless the thermometer the ophthalmoscope the auricular speculum the laryngoscope nervous irritation on the living body opened out to the physician possibilities of delicate and yet certain diagnosis where there seemed to be absolute darkness the continually increasing number of proved parasitical organisms substitute tangible objects for mystical entities and teach the surgeon to forestall the fearfully subtle diseases of decomposition end of section fourteen but do not think gentlemen that the struggle is at an end as long as there are people of such astounding conceit as to imagine that they can effect by a few clever strokes that which man can otherwise only hope to achieve by toilsome labor hypotheses will be started which propounded as dogmas at once promise to solve all riddles as long as there are people who believe implicitly in that which they wish to be true so long will the hypotheses of the former find credence both classes will certainly not die out and to the latter the majority will always belong there are two characteristics more particularly which metaphysical systems have always possessed in the first place man is always desirous of feeling himself to be a being of a higher order far beyond the standard of the rest of nature this wish is satisfied by the spiritualists on the other hand he would like to believe that by his thought he was unrestrained lord of the world and of course by his thinking with those conceptions to the development of which he has attained this is attempted to be satisfied by the materialists but one who like the physician has actively to face natural forces which bring about weal or woe is also under the obligation of seeking for a knowledge of the truth and of the truth only without considering whether what he finds is pleasant in one way or the other his aim is one which is firmly settled for him 
the success of facts is alone finally decisive. He must endeavor to ascertain beforehand what will be the result of his attack if he pursues this or that course. In order to acquire this foreknowledge of what is coming, but of what has not been settled by observations, no other method is possible than that of endeavoring to arrive at the laws of facts by observations, and we can only learn them by induction, by the careful selection, collation, and observation of those cases which fall under the law. When we fancy that we have arrived at a law, the business of deduction commences. It is then our duty to develop the consequences of our law as completely as may be, but in the first place only to apply them to the test of experience, so far as they can be tested, and then to decide by this test whether the law holds, and to what extent. This is a test which really never ceases. The true natural philosopher reflects, at each new phenomenon, whether the best established laws of the best known forces may not experience a change. It can, of course, only be a question of a change which does not contradict the whole store of our previously collected experiences. It never thus attains unconditional truth, but such a high degree of probability that it is practically equal to certainty. The metaphysicians may amuse themselves at this. We will take their mocking to heart when they are in a position to do better, or even as well. The old words of Socrates, the prime master of inductive definitions, in reference to them, are just as fresh as they were two thousand years ago. Quote, they imagined they knew what they did not know, and he, at any rate, had the advantage of pretending to know what he did not know. End quote. And again, he was surprised at its not being clear to them that it is not possible for men to discover such things. Even those who most prided themselves on the speeches made on the matter did not agree among themselves, but behaved to each other like madmen, tos minomenos homoios. Socrates calls them tos miston phanontos. Schopenhauer calls himself a Mont Blanc by the side of a mole heap when he compares himself with a natural philosopher. The pupils admire these big words and try to imitate the master. In speaking against the empty manufacture of hypotheses, do not by any means suppose that I wish to diminish the real value of original thoughts. The first discovery of a new law is the discovery of a similarity which has hitherto been concealed in the course of natural processes. It is a manifestation of that which our forefathers, in a serious sense, described as wit. It is of the same quality as the highest performances of artistic perception in the discovery of new types of expression. It is something which cannot be forced, and which cannot be acquired by any known method. Hence all those aspire after it, who wish to pass as the favored children of genius. It seems, too, so easy, so free from trouble, to get by sudden mental flashes an unattainable advantage over our contemporaries. The true artist and the true inquirer knows that great works can only be produced by hard work. The proof that the idea is formed do not merely scrape together superficial resemblances, but are produced by a quick glance into the connection of the whole, can only be acquired when these ideas are completely developed. That is, for a newly discovered natural law, only by its agreement with facts. This estimate must by no means be regarded as depending on external success, but the success is here closely connected with the depth and completeness of the preliminary perceptions. To find superficial resemblances is easy. It is amusing in society, and witty thoughts soon procure for their author the name of a clever man. Among the great number of such ideas, there must be some which are ultimately found to be partially or wholly correct. It would be a stroke of skill always to guess falsely. In such a happy chance, a man can loudly claim his priority for the discovery, if otherwise a lucky oblivion conceals the false conclusions. The adherents of such a process are glad to certify the value of a first thought. Conscientious workers, who are shy at bringing their thoughts before the public before they have tested them in all directions, solved all doubts, and have firmly established the proof, these are at a decided disadvantage. To settle the present kind of questions of priority only by the date of their first publication, and without considering the ripeness of the research, has seriously favored this mischief. In the type case of the printer, all the wisdom of the world is contained, which has been or can be discovered. 
it is only requisite to know how the letters are to be arranged. So also, in the hundreds of books and pamphlets which are every year published about ether, the structure of atoms, the theory of perception, as well as on the nature of the ascetic fever and carcinoma, all the most refined shades of possible hypotheses are exhausted, and among these there must necessarily be many fragments of the correct theory, but who knows how to find them? I insist upon this in order to make clear to you that all this literature of untried and unconfirmed hypotheses has no value in the progress of science. On the contrary, the few sound ideas which they may contain are concealed by the rubbish of the rest and one who wants to publish something really new, facts, sees himself open to the danger of countless claims of priority unless he is prepared to waste time and power in reading beforehand a quantity of absolutely useless books and to destroy his reader's patience by a multitude of useless quotations. Our generation has had to suffer under the tyranny of spiritualistic metaphysics. The newer generation will probably have to guard against that of the materialistic hypotheses. Kant's rejection of the claims of pure thought has gradually made some impression, but Kant allowed one way of escape. It was as clear to him as to Socrates that all metaphysical systems which up to that time had been propounded were tissues of false conclusions. His Critique der reinen Vernunft is a continual sermon against the use of the category of thought beyond the limits of possible experience. But geometry seemed to him to do something which metaphysics was striving after. And hence, geometrical axioms, which he looked upon as a priori principles antecedent to all experience, he held to be given by transcendental intuition, or as the inherent form of all external intuition. Since that time, pure a priori intuition has been the anchoring ground of metaphysicians. It is even more convenient than pure thought, because everything can be heaped on it without going into chains of reasoning, which might be capable of proof or of refutation. The nativistic theory of perception of the senses is the expression of this theory in physiology. All mathematicians united to fight against any attempt to resolve the intuitions into their natural elements whether the so-called pure or the empirical, the axioms of geometry, the principles of mechanics, or the perceptions of vision. For this reason, therefore, the mathematical investigations of Lobachevsky, Gauss, and Riemann on the alterations which are logically possible in the axioms of geometry, and the proof that the axioms are principles which are to be confirmed, or perhaps even refuted, by experience, and can accordingly be acquired from experience, these I consider to be very important steps. That all metaphysical sects get into a rage about this must not lead you astray, for these investigations lay the axe at the basis of apparently the firmest supports which their claims still possess. Against those investigators who endeavor to eliminate from among the perceptions of the senses whatever there may be of the actions of memory and of the repetition of similar impressions which occur in memory, whatever, in short, is a matter of experience. Against them, it is attempted to raise a party cry that they are spiritualists, as if memory, experience, and custom were not also facts whose laws are to be sought and which are not to be explained away because they cannot be glibly referred to reflex actions and to the complex of the prolongation of ganglionic cells and of the connection of nerve fibers in the brain. Indeed, however self-evident, and however important the principle may appear to be, that natural science has to seek for the laws of facts. This principle is nevertheless often forgotten. In recognizing the law found as a force which rules the processes in nature, we conceive it objectively as a force, and such a reference of individual cases to a force which, under given conditions, produces a definite result that we designate as a causal explanation of phenomena. We cannot always refer to the forces of atoms. We speak of a refractive force, of electromotive and of electrodynamic force. But do not forget the given conditions and the given result. If these cannot be given, the explanation attempted is merely a modest confession of ignorance, and then it is decidedly better to confess this openly. If any process in vegetation, 
is referred to forces in the cells without a closer definition of the conditions among which and of the direction in which they work. This can at most assert that the more remote parts of the organism are without influence, but it would be difficult to confirm this with certainty in more than a few cases. In like manner, the originally definite sense which Johannes Müller gave to the idea of reflex action is gradually evaporated into this, that when an impression has been made on any part of the nervous system and an action occurs in any other part, this is supposed to have been explained by saying that it is a reflex action. Much may be imposed upon the irresolvable complexity of the nerve fibers of the brain, but the resemblance to the qualities occulta of ancient medicine is very suspicious. From the entire chain of my argument, it follows that what I have said against metaphysics is not intended against philosophy, but metaphysicians have always tried to plume themselves on being philosophers, and philosophical amateurs have mostly taken an interest in the high-flying speculations of the metaphysicians, by which they hope in a short time, and at no great trouble, to learn the whole of what is worth knowing. On another occasion, I compared the relationship of metaphysics to philosophy with that of astrology to astronomy. The former had the most exciting interest for the public at large, and especially for the fashionable world, and turned its alleged connoisseurs into influential persons. Astronomy, on the contrary, although it had become the ideal of scientific research, had to be content with a small number of quietly working disciples. In like manner, philosophy, if it gives up metaphysics, still possesses a wide and important field, the knowledge of mental and spiritual processes and their laws. Just as the anatomist, when he has reached the limits of microscopic vision, must try to gain an insight into the action of his optical instrument, in like manner every scientific inquirer must study minutely the chief instrument of his research as to its capabilities. The groping of the medical schools for the last 2,000 years is, among other things, an illustration of the harm of erroneous views in this respect. And the physician, the statesman, the jurist, the clergyman, and the teacher ought to be able to build upon a knowledge of physical processes if they wish to acquire a true scientific basis for their practical activity. But the true science of philosophy has had, perhaps, to suffer more from the evil mental habits and the false ideals of metaphysics than even medicine itself. One word of warning. I should not like you to think that my statements are influenced by personal irritation. I need not explain that one who has such opinions as I have laid before you, who impresses on his pupils whenever he can, the principle that a metaphysical conclusion is either a false conclusion or a concealed experimental conclusion, that he is not exactly beloved by the votaries of metaphysics or of intuitive conceptions. Metaphysicians, like all those who cannot give any decisive reasons to their opponents, are usually not very polite in their controversy. One's own success may approximately be estimated from the increasing want of politeness in the replies. My own researches have led me more than other disciples of the School of Natural Science into controversial regions, and the expressions of metaphysical discontent have perhaps concerned me even more than my friends, as many of you are doubtless aware. In order, therefore, to leave my own personal opinions quite on one side, I have allowed two unsuspecting warrantors to speak for me, Socrates and Kant, both of whom were certain that all metaphysical systems established up to their time were full of empty, false conclusions, and who guarded themselves against adding any new ones. In order to show that the matter has not changed, either in the last two thousand years or in the last one hundred years, let me conclude with a sentence of one who was, unfortunately, too soon taken away from us, Frederick Albert Lang, the author of The History of Materialism. In his posthumous Logical Studies, which he wrote in anticipation of his approaching end, he gives the following picture, which struck me because it would hold just as well in reference to solidar or humoral pathologists or any other of the old dogmatic schools of medicine. Lang says, The Hegelian ascribes to the Habartian a less perfect knowledge than to himself, and conversely, but neither hesitates to consider the knowledge of the other to be higher compared with that of the empiricist 
and to recognize in it, at any rate, an approximation to the only true knowledge. It is seen also that here no regard is paid to the validity of the proof, and that a mere statement in the form of a deduction from the entirety of the system is recognized as apodictic knowledge. Let us then throw no stones at our old medical predecessors, who in dark ages, and with but slight preliminary knowledge, fell into precisely the same errors as the great intelligences of what wishes to be thought the illuminated nineteenth century. They did no worse than their predecessors, except that the nonsense of their method was more prominent in the matter of natural sciences. Let us work on. In this work of true intelligence, physicians are called upon to play a prominent part. Among those who are continually called upon actively to preserve and apply their knowledge of nature, you are those who begin with the best mental preparation and are acquainted with the most varied regions of natural phenomena. In order, finally, to conclude our consultation on the condition of dame medicine correctly with the epicresis, I think we have every reason to be content with the success of the treatment which the School of Natural Science has applied, and we can only recommend the younger generation to continue the same therapeutics. End of section 15